Don't take my picture. You want to take my picture? Look, look through here. You can take my picture. Is that right? Okay, now you have to ask me a question. Didn't your mother show you how to break a stick? You're my mother. <laughs> See, nothing to do here. <laughs> Now, did your father come from Japan? Was he born in Japan or was he born in the... No, uh, he was born in Japan. He was born so in Japan. So, go to call a Jap. My mama and papa grew strawberries. Strawberries? Yeah. They had a strawberry farm and that's probably taken away. What about Vince Tajiri? There is no Tajiri. We Thank have you. a father named Vince Tajiri. No, 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 no. Me? No, I'm gonna take care of you. You have to learn about yourself. Why I'm this way, why I'm that way. And what are you learning about yourself? Oh, you'll be surprised. You'll be so surprised. That was the trailer for the feature documentary, Wisdom Gone Wild. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. Wisdom Gone Wild is a tender, bittersweet look at a mother in the twilight years of her life, which also sheds light on the nature of wisdom, memory, and reality in the shadows of dementia. Join us as we learn more about Rose Tajiri, as filmed by her youngest child, award-winning artist and filmmaker, Rhea Tajiri. Wisdom Gone Wild is an incredibly intimate and poignant film that you will not want to miss. Stay tuned. Rhea Tajiri, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Very good. Um, thank you for inviting me to uh, be in conversation with you this evening. Well, it's it's very much appreciated, as you say this evening, because although you're U.S.-based, you're in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, to be more precise, uh, this evening, and we're U.K.-based, and we're talking about Wisdom Gone Wild. Uh, it's uh, done the festival circuit in 2022, I know. It's an uh, id phenomenon for best feature-length docs, so hence why you're in Amsterdam. So congratulations on that. Uh, I know you got best doc at Black Star, and you've had a host of other wins. So, uh, and maybe more, just as important, let's say, is it's releasing on PBS in America on November twentieth. We do have PBS here in the UK. I'm not sure if it will be showing there, but uh, if you're not US based, everyone do have a look out for for this film. So, welcome and and congratulations again on uh, all the accolades and your success. Thank you. I just want to make one small correction is that I was an honorable mention, jury honorable mention at Black Star because I don't want to upstage the actual best documentary feature winner. Uh, so just, just wanted to say that. Thank you for correcting me. So before we, uh, well, maybe w the way we usually kick off is uh, I ask our guest and uh, in this case yourself, what is, what is Wisdom Gone Wild all about? Maybe give us a synopsis. Sure. So Wisdom Gone Wild is essentially a film about caregiving a loved one. And in this case, it's uh, my mother. Uh, my mother, I was my mother's caregiver for 16 years. And um, it is told is basically a cinematic poem. That's how I call it. It's, mm -hmm. It has a poetic follows a poetic structure. 
Um, it follows her dream logic because that's how she communicated with us. Um, it was important to me to kind of center the film around how she communicated. Um, I wanted to kind of um, maybe have the viewer adjust a little bit of how they experience dementia. Um, and I was able to draw upon uh, a lovely archive of uh, photographs. My father mm -hmm. was a professional photographer. He took great family photos. So it kind of jumps around through different moments of her mm -hmm. life. And um, it, it basically honors the span of her life. And I think this is something that when you take care of someone who lives with dementia, you'll see how they may go back and forth into their memory and call up different moments from their life. Mm. And I wanted to mirror that in the film. So, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your mother. Who was oh. she? Um, she lived a long and fruitful life, I gather. But, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, as you said, your father was this, uh, this photographer and uh, documented your lives. But, I mean, I guess... So you can tell us about your mother, but also there was was there this past that you didn't know much about. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that correct? Right. So my mother was a really intriguing person. She was very mysterious, um, very secretive, very private. Um, she was born in the 20s during the Depression. She's a Nisei, so she's second generation Japanese American. Um, her mm -hmm. parents immigrated, you know, the turn of the century. Uh, they were farmers, so she grew up in a, you know, Japanese American farming community in Salinas, California. Um, and uh, I don't know that much about her early life, except little, you know, little stories and things. But I did find some photos, which are in the film, which were really kind of um, astonishing, I guess, because uh, they were poor, but somebody must have had um, a camera. So right. she's she appears to be very plucky. Um, you know, she, at one point she's holding a camera, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very creative. Um, I think if she had had the opportunity, she would, probably would have been an artist or an art historian. She loved art. And, uh, you know, she expressed her creativity. She became a beautician. And so um, she uh, married my father. Uh, she went through the uh, U.S. concentration camps during World mm -hmm. War II. Um, she was in post in Arizona. And she was able to leave to uh, to marry my father, who was in the U.S. Army at that point. Um, when the war was over, they ended up settling in Chicago. Uh, I'm she, you know, she had three kids. I'm the youngest of the three, mm -hmm. uh, and um, she was eccentric and she loved art. So she dragged us to art museums. My brother is a jazz musician. My sister was a painter. And I'm the baby, and I became the filmmaker. Uh, so she had a big influence on our creativity. And then, um, you know, I think late in life was able to go back to college and studied art history and was deeply, uh, you know, enmeshed in that. So that kind of is, in a nutshell, who she was. She, you know, she did not have a career. She uh, stopped working at a certain point mm -hmm. um, and kind of devoted herself to being a, a housewife mm -hmm. and a mother. And so, as you say, you were her caregiver for the last 16 years of her, of her life. What did you discover in that process? So, you know, what yeah. personal insights did you have? And then I'll have a follow-up, but yeah, what did you discover? Sure. So, you know, in the beginning, um, like most people will tell you, it was very, very devastating. And I remember thinking, oh, I, I really, you know, she's going to forget everything. And I have all these questions I want to ask her. And I still never got the answer to these deep mysteries in her life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, I I felt like, okay, I'm going to lose all this, all this important information, right? And um, it was very frustrating in the beginning. And then uh, I sort of had this breakthrough at one point where I started to realize, like, you know, and probably through exhaustion, um, if I just follow her logic and if I just follow, enter her world and just kind of go with the flow of what she's telling me, I actually am starting to learn more about her by just letting her go through this process. Mm. It, and it was kind of like, you know, I say a dream. It was kind of like all these kind of things that she had mentioned 
they were connected to real things in her life. So she might be talking symbolically, you know, mm -hmm. she um, would say things that sounded really uh, nonsensical, but they turned out to be connected to something that happened to her. So I did end up learning more about her and her camp experience, things that she didn't want to mm -hmm. talk about, you know, and such. And what personal insights did you gain about dementia itself, this this thing that's not even a disease, we don't even know really what it, you know, it's just this thing that, and and I have some personal experience with it myself. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's uh, it's this kind of long, you know, you this this you slowly see someone disappear before your eyes in in many ways, or at least the person you knew. So right. did you did you gain any insights yourself about the what it what about dementia? Um, you know, I think dementia affects everybody very differently. Um, I, my mom, uh, I was in, I, I had her in three different, I kept moving her. Um, she was in three different assisted livings. But along that way, I got to observe a lot of people who had dementia or mild cognitive impairment, what, you know, they have different names for it sometimes. Right. But I did meet a lot of people and a lot of families. Um, I, I really felt like the thing that I learned was um, I had to kind of recalibrate my expectations and kind of just slow down and give in and surrender to the process um, that that actually, um, you know, we're so used to, you know, having to control things and having things mm -hmm. follow a certain logic, but kind of letting, letting go of that and just kind of going with what presented itself turned out to be the most generative and productive and creative way of engaging and communicating. So I felt like I was able to find ways to connect with my mother and, um, you know, find, find meaning in the experience with her. Hmm. And, um, um, you know, and so, as you say, your, your first reaction was that it was going to, this is devast this is going to be devastating, all these things, but then, it does happen over the course of so many years. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that, you know, do you find yourself, did you find yourself adjusting? Did you, you know, how you, you it almost becomes, a, it's a huge segment of your life and her, her life as, as well. Yeah, I think um, it was, yeah, there was a, there was a, it was a long process, right? I think actually when the onset came on, I was at, you know, a very big career breakthrough as a filmmaker. I was going to Venice. I was going to go to the Venice Film Festival. Right. And it was something we had been, you know, like dreaming and yeah, the film is finished. It's going to these, you know, we entered it in festivals. And then I got the news on one day, okay, we're going to go to Venice. So I called her, we were excited. We were, you know, sort of celebrating on the phone. She said, call me tomorrow. Let's talk some more. Mm -hmm. I called her the next day and it was as though... There was this other person on the phone, and she said, who are you? She thought I was imp I was uh, an imposter, and she mm -hmm. had no recollection of the conversation we had the day before. And I was, of course, completely devastated um, and shocked. So, um, you know, that was the beginning. Um, and there was a period of, that was in 1997, so there was a period of about two two years, um, you know, I was just thrashing around, talking to people, doing research, trying different things. Um, and we found a gerontologist and I got a diagnosis in 1999. Of course, it was the thing that I feared, you know, mm. the big um, thing that everyone's afraid of is dementia and Alzheimer's. Right. And so then I, you know, um, I uh, had to come to terms with that and sit with the grief and the loss and um, after a period of time, I started thinking about, well, what am I losing here? What will, you know, what's going to happen? Right. And um, in that in that process came to say, okay, well, maybe if I think that, you know, I will not be able to connect, talk to her anymore, um, how do I learn to accept that? How, what do I do now? What are the steps I can take now? Mm -hmm. And that kind of turned into a kind of process of like, well, what do we like to do? We like to go to museums. Well, let's just go to museums then, you know? Right, right. And so I found things that we liked to do together and that we could do together in the present moment. And that turned into this really like an opening for uh, both of us. We started to, you know, my mom had these incredibly interesting insights, almost like a child, like, uh, you know, kind of 
view of of art which which was very fresh mm. and not intellectual. It was just really kind of very spontaneous in the moment, emotional responses. So it was really interesting to sort of see her in that new way. And so that was like, okay, um, maybe you know there are interesting ways to provide stimulation um, that might shift her a little bit. And that's kind of what we I kept doing and trying with her. It became a thing of trying different things and failing sometimes and having also miserable periods where she mm-hmm. wouldn't respond to anything and it was extremely frustrating. Um, and just finding ways to connect to friends and family for support, you know. Mm-hmm. But also just kind of, um, you know, I started out saying it was about like my career and I, I felt really like, okay, you know, this is really heavy. I didn't feel like making work. But I also, and I also felt this identity loss, but then I started to kind of realize, you know, caregiving is a really important thing. It's you're really sustaining another person at the end of their life. This could be actually a very beautiful Mm -hmm. um, experience if you give into it and say, well, maybe I don't need to be this, you know, front and center. I have this career front and center right now. And that was, you know, it's kind of a negotiation there, but it turned out to be very um, interesting and profound in that way. I think it's more about, you know, about life itself, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Well, actually, let's, let's hold that thought. I'm going to give our, uh, our listeners and viewers an early break. So we'll be right back with award-winning artist and filmmaker Rhea Tajiri, writer, producer, and director of Wisdom Gone Wild, releasing on PBS in the U.S. on November 20th. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook. Instagram, or X to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning filmmaker Rhea Tajiri. She's the writer, producer, and director of Wisdom Gone Wild. It's uh, releasing on PBS on November 20th. It's done the film uh, festival circuit. It's at IDFA at the moment, a nominee for... Best feature length doc. Um, we were talking about you know this this your experience as a caregiver with your with your mother, and you had also been talking earlier about how you sort of just learned to communicate with her on sort of her terms, if 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 you will. Um, I mean, so this and, and you filmed the last years of her life as you are her caregiver. I mean, what do you? Maybe for our audience, what do you capture? What did you capture? Uh, I mean, because the other thing is the film really. We can get to this point. You've already talked about that, as you described it as cinematic poem. It it sort of centers on these on this reality of these wisdoms in the in the shadows of dementia. So what what are these wisdoms, mm-hmm. and and what do they tell us about memory and reality and and life? I, I I mentioned that I I was looking for these, you know I think these different ways that my mother had, um, you know these her her eccentricities I guess, yeah. and um, I also, you know the the way that the film was shot was it wasn't like I said okay we're gonna hire a crew we're gonna right. sit you know we're gonna do a verite we're gonna you know come mm. to this. Uh, location every day we're going to watch life unfold it was kind of well it started out first as i'm not shooting her everyone said oh you must make a film because i would come to visit friends or i'd see my family i'd say oh my gosh this thing happened today was amazing my mom said this to me and then i said this you know it was that kind of thing and it's oh you got to film this and i said no i'm not doing that but over time uh i wanted to keep in touch with people I, I was away a lot and family wanted to know how we were doing. So I, I, I shot little photos. I shot little mm. clips on my iPhone with my point and shoot. And I just collected all these cool things. and I would send them to people and people were like, this is really interesting. Like you really should make a film. And I kept saying, no, I don't want to. And then after a while, it started to go, you know, I, I started seeing the accumulation. I went, maybe right. I should, you know, maybe this is actually you know, I also started to realize the more I was doing this, I had a lot of insights into caregiving that other people didn't have mm-hmm. who were just starting the process. And I thought, I-, I need to share this experience. I need to, you know, kind of let people know, like add to this conversation, which is, you know, of course, always about devastation. And and there's other parts, there's other dimensions to caregiving. So, um, 
so yeah so i started saying okay um let's see how like there's this you know I had to find ways to kind of categorize these different things that I had of her. And so I organized it around these wisdoms. And so it was like beauty, beauty and art, um, animals, spirit. She was very spiritual. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, mm. how I, how I came up with that. And yeah. those are the kind of the stanzas of the, of the poem are kind of organized around that. And, and did you, um, I mean, so, as you're saying, your friends are telling you you need to make a film. But when did you decide? When did how did you know you had a film on your hands? I mean, and and also this this consideration you want to be protective of your mother. What do right. you you know reveal or not reveal? Yeah, that that was a really important. Those are were very important uh, yeah. questions I had throughout. Um, so uh, I I guess it was it was pretty late in the process because I you know. She, started in 1997 and this is maybe now going to 2014 and um i i think i was at that point where i felt like i you know it was things were starting to gel and i felt like yes i, I really do have something to say here so let's let's do some test shooting let's um, let me go out and um I'll, I'll hire a DP. I'll, I'll go out. We'll do this. I know what we'll do. We'll go to the art museum because that's one of our favorite things to do. Mm. And it will be the most generative. She'll be very excited and, you know, we'll be very connected. Um, and so we went out and we shot what is in the film as the, the streamers, the yellow streamers right, right. at LACMA. Yeah. And that, you know, we were shooting different things, looking at art. My mom was making her usual comments and, and then we decided to go out to the yard and I had never seen this installation before. And we just kind of wheeled in and then like the, this magic just started to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was really floored. I'm like, oh, wow, I don't believe this is happening. It was very cinematic and very beautiful. Yeah. And it was just one of those, you know, as a filmmaker, you know, you've hit on something like something is just completely you know, the universe is like, everything is gelling in the most really beautiful way. And we had this gorgeous footage. And I knew, I mean, I could tell. I was even shooting with my little point and shoot. And my mother, basically what happens is my mother enters this this installation, this art installation, and these children come up. And they're completely fascinated with her. And of course, she's completely fascinated with them. And they just start like reaching towards each other and laughing and playing. And you know, of course, the children are not, they're young, they're, they're maybe toddler and, and a little mm -hmm. older. Um, and they're not necessarily like, you know, they're, they're not like, I, I, they're okay with her kind of the way she communicates, they're just totally accepting of her. And mostly what she's expressing is her joy, and she's laughing, and, and then they start laughing. And then, you know, in this installation, it's, it's uh, the way it's set up is that you can run through these like hanging streamers, so they're very free. And so it, there's this pure joy and delight in the in that scene and mm. that's what we captured and then i said okay i think we can do this you know this will be really interesting but you had been filming you, you know you have footage in there from i mean you're a filmmaker so obviously you you, you <laughs> at different times you've filmed your family and your, your yeah. and your mother but you've is this was this something that was in without maybe knowing was always in the works well i think i think that like you know, sometimes you take photos, you go, well, maybe I'll use this someday for something, you right. know, or you shoot a clip and go, you know, I might use this for something. Or, you know, maybe this is a sketch for, you know, I can build something off of this sketch, right? Yeah. That's, I am always shooting little things, right? I think, yeah, if you're a filmmaker, you're always seeing ideas in the world, so. And yeah. what did your, and what about your family? I mean, they must have, you know, uh, did they push back on this or did they think it was a great idea or? You know, my <laughs> my family is, uh, they don't question it. Oh, here's, she is with the camera <laughs> again. Okay, hi. Right. You know? And in fact, they'll like goof me up. They'll try to goof mm. up. Me and my brother will try to do something that right, will annoy right. me. You know, he's, it's, 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 it's my father, though, was always pulling out the camera. And we did the same thing to him, you know. Right. Well, here he is with the camera. He stick it in our face. We're going to make a, you know, a face yeah. to him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we were all used to this kind of photography and filming. But many filmmakers I've I've interviewed would say they they could never imagine going in front of the camera. But you are in front of the camera in this in this film. How how did how did you feel about that? Was that difficult? It was difficult. 
it was more difficult to edit because you have to look at yourself and go, oh, God, I looked horrible that day. You know, everything from like, yeah, it just, yeah, it was really hard. Um, you know, I worked with an editor, obviously. Um, mm. uh, but what my producer said to me was, um, you know, you're going to have to be in it because you know, by default, it's about caregiving. You can't just be behind the camera and you have to see, it's it's about the two of you. You have to be the two of you engaging, you know? Mm. So that's that's what kind of what ended up happening. Okay. And and what's the, uh, what's the uh, reaction been to this film besides the critical acclaim? Um, I think that people, I mean, I, I'm very happy because I think, for the most part, people um, who are caregivers and people who are aging uh, and surprisingly young people mm -hmm. are finding the film to be very um, uh, emotionally resonant. Um, hmm. They connect to it. They, they see so people who are caregivers see them, their experience uh, mirrored. They see themselves acknowledged. I think caregiving is, for the most part, it's, it's, it's pretty invisible, right? Mm. So I think they're pretty happy to see this this representation i guess and at least it's my own personal impression maybe um but you know when i mean caregivers generally but certainly i think as a society where you know if, if we know someone's got cancer or a terminal illness there's something there but i i almost feel like as uh, as being part of a family that's been through something like this you don't really feel like you you don't realize others are going through this and what it really means you know well you can do this as you as you did and probably much better job uh you know those first couple of years searching trying to find out um i mean it was i'm talking about my fa late father i mean you know he wouldn't even let us take us to the doctor so we never oh, got yeah. it so you never get the diagnosis so yeah. you don't really know and then there's this hope sometimes you get these false hopes and glimmers that maybe yeah. this isn't as bad and then it just before you know it 10 years have passed and i mean um when he uh when he passed away we even real you know started talking around it we realized it actually had started mu much earlier than we had even realized yeah yeah. yeah 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 my you know my mom was not an easy person to care for it looks like she was <laughs> but she right. really wasn't right. in the sense like uh she uh so you know i lived in new york she was in los angeles at the time and then i moved to philly but right. uh, you know i couldn't be there all the time and then there were points at which you know she was doing things that were dangerous in the house we like right. started little fires and you know things that you know oh uh, there was a beehive in your wall yes, you upstairs you know yeah. just like ah, right you're freaking out uh she tried to 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 store sushi and then in the oven and then say hey hi here you know i'm like oh mm. you know are you eating yeah. this no you no one can eat this no stop you know yeah. things that just did not make sense and they were scary so i tried to get a caregiver to come in to help her out and she would lock her out she would trick her and lock her out you know i mean she was not an easy person. She did not want anyone to take care of her. And uh, she was fiercely independent. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, I understand to a degree, but it was really hard. And I couldn't convince her to go to a doctor, but I found ways to get her to go, yeah. you know. Um, and I didn't even want to get into that. <laughs> it's no. a whole shenanigans. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, she it was extremely difficult. Um, and, <clears throat> and, um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Where are we going with well, this? Well, I was sorry. just talking about how, you know, the uh, what's the reaction been to this film? And you've said how it's resonated with people, including young people. And mm -hmm. I think my reaction was that I think probably for a lot of us, it feels like a film. I mean, there have been other films. We've had them on who've dealt with sort of end-of-life issues and things like that. Uh, but uh, maybe there are others, but this, this one really, without, you know, it is... I imagine, not that you, you get pigeonholed, but I imagine people say, oh, it's a film about dementia. But it is so much more than that, obviously. Yeah. But at the same time, it is a film about dementia in that for those of us who and those who are maybe starting to go through it, it was kind of a, oh, well, yeah, I recognize this. I, I know these, these sort of situations where 
mm-hmm. um, they don't, you know, the person doesn't recognize you or seemingly maybe they're mixing up history or, or memories mm-hmm. or maybe they're not in a way, in a way they're remembering things maybe in a, in a different way that mm-hmm. we, that's not conventional. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's a, uh, it's this other world that you don't even real, at least you don't even realize you're entering, you know, mm-hmm. at the, at the time. So I think, uh, I would imagine this has resonated with a lot of a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I mean, with, I think. Well, ahead. I was going to say that, like you know, you mentioned um, misremembering. So there's an example in the film that I, I really. Um, she always people would say, "Oh, does your mother remember who you are?" That was always the thing that people would ask me. Right. And to me, it was sort of like beside the point because, yes, yeah, sometimes she thought I was her sister, right. but I kind of. I don't know why, but it made sense to me, and I didn't mind that she. And cause, okay, we're we're in cahoots together. This is right. more fun than being like her daughter, and she's got to take care of me. It was, hey, right. we're gonna go out and have an adventure today. Let's let's go shopping. You know, right. let's buy right. clothes, whatever. It was, it, I I just went with it because it was. I could I knew it would be interesting, right? Hmm. And then after a while, I realized, you know, her sister was an artist. That's this is the sister who died. Right. That's so interesting that she's like saying, "Oh, you're Betty," you know, because. In fact, I'm an artist, so that's cool. And then yeah. I thought, now I'm thinking about Betty, and I never really thought about her, and that was really lovely to me, you know? Right. So, you know, I kind of got something out of that, <laughs> if that makes any sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can, I can certainly see that. Um, I, mean, I mean, the story in my family that was told recently was that my father just um, turned to my mother and basically said, I'm your husband, right? And she's like, <laughs> yes. She goes, well, who's that man on the wall? And it was their wedding picture, you know. <laughs> What's he doing? And, you know, <laughs> if I'm your husband, who's that? <laughs> who is that guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, what, I mean, what do you, I've, this is a bad question to ask, but, you know, do you, what, what advice would you give? Or do you feel like you can give advice to those who have loved ones who are, Suffering I from do dementia. get asked this a lot. And yeah. so, you know, this is because I'm going to give this answer because this is actually my philosophy mm. about caregiving that I developed, you know, and it's just that you you have to, ser- this is not an, a popular American kind of sensibility, but I'm going to say it anyway, you know, you really do have to surrender in a certain way. Mm. There's nothing you can do. You know, um, sure, they're going to find a cure, but I, I don't think that that's really going to happen in the way that people want, you know, mm. right now, right, right, you know. And and so for the time being, I feel like, you know, the the, the best you can do is make somebody's life meaningful, right, and take care of them and be make them comfortable mm. and enjoy and connect, finding different ways to connect. So sometimes that means surrendering, don't correct them, stop, you know, I did that for years, because I was embarrassed. Oh my God, she's saying this. I better correct her. So you know, but no, stop that. And then kind of allowing her and listening really deeply. You know, just not thinking about what I'm going to say, but really taking in what she was saying, even if sometimes it didn't make sense. Later on, I go, that does make sense. You know, like right. I would figure out that she was really trying to communicate something that was important, and then I should really just listen and be, you know, be the listener for once. Mm-hmm. And then I learned a lot that way. So I, I don't know. These are things that that I found made the experience um, more more tolerable, but also mm-hmm. very meaningful and very profound. Mm-hmm. So that's I my think that <laughs> I think that's great advice, and I think it's great advice for life in general. Even if you, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> even yes. if you're, you know, um, <laughs> I should probably leave things there. But we we are coming to the end of our time, and just before we do uh, do go. Um, What's what's next for you? Are you just r- relishing this great, all this great <laughs> stuff that's happening around this film and being in Amsterdam for, for for the this festival and all the accolades? Well, you're I'm getting? here um, because um, actually, so Wisdom played last year in competition, and um, I won uh, the Chicken and Egg Award, which is this mm-hmm. amazing award given to eight filmmakers. It's a career boost. Mm-hmm. And uh, it culminates in there. You you go to IDFA and you yeah. have a new project that you're developing, and you you get to meet with people. 
So I'm here working. Uh, I have a new project in development. It's about my father. Okay. It's called Non-Alien. And um, it, it's about my father uh, who uh, was a photojournalist. And um, he was the founding photography editor for Playboy magazine. Right. But it's not about that. It's right. really focusing on a time in his life right after World War II when he was trying to figure out what to do. And he was very uncertain times. And he started documenting um, Japanese Americans who were settling in Chicago, arriving from the camps and just kind wow. of documenting their lives. And so, again, uh, it's poetic. It's going to be told through uh, a series of set pieces based on his photos. Okay. And it has a sort of I set it up so that there's. Uh, I draw. I'm drawing from writings. He was a newspaper writer, uh, so from the 30s to the 40s. Mm -hmm. So his newspaper articles, and then his grandson, who's my nephew, uh, his writings. So I kind of have them in conversation. Oh wow! Yeah, that's that's incredible. That's uh, well. If we haven't scared you I, off, we'd love to have you back on to discuss that whenever that uh, drops. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so well, well, good luck with that. And it's nice to have a filmmaker who can actually tell us what their next project is. So many of them tell <laughs> us, "Oh, I can't tell you yet. It's still, uh, you know." So thank you so I'm much. Excited. Thank you and, so much for the conversation. Well, thank you. And thank you for this. Uh, I, you know, I know it's a deeply personal film. So thank you to you and your family for, for sharing this and, and your, your mother's life. So uh, just remind our listeners and viewers, we've been talking to award-winning filmmaker Rhea Tajiri, uh, the writer, producer, and director of Wisdom Gone Wild, releasing on PBS on November 20th. Check it out. Thanks again. Thanks again for joining us on Factual America. A big shout out to everyone at Intersound Audio in York, England for their great studio and fine editing and production skills. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, which specializes in documentaries, television, and shorts about the U.S. for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is factualamerica.com.